It's good to be here with you for this completely spontaneous live stream. I'm trying to get in the habit of streaming and posting more, so I thought this was a great opportunity to come on and do that today. And the only thing that popped in my mind was harmonica survival tips. I honestly have no idea what we're going to talk about other than that broad umbrella topic. Um, I hadn't really put much thought into it, but I'm sure that I can come up with some good stuff for you on the spot. Um, I think one good thing that comes to mind before you think about survival tips is kind of your interests and goals. You know, what do you really want from your instrument? What do you want to do with this? When I was learning to play harmonica at, at the very beginning, for me, it was a no-brainer. I was, I was just hooked by the blues. It was Guy Forsyth, actually, who hooked me. So I figured I'd come on and, and kind of, maybe we connect those two ideas or something. You know what I mean? Like figuring out what you like and what you love is paramount. Same thing when you're looking for teachers too. If you're gonna work with somebody, you can't just say I love their playing or I love their teaching. I think you need a little bit of both. I think that's the secret to a successful relationship with your teacher is that you found somebody that you really connect with the way they teach and the way they play. Think about that for a minute. I guarantee you there's people out there that have ended up working with teachers who they love their playing, but they just could not connect from, from their teaching perspective. And so they ended up stopping it. So when you work with somebody, make sure you've got both of those. All right. Once you kind of narrow down, and good morning, uh, Michael, and some other friends that are tuning in. Oh, there we go. Now I can see it. Stephanie. Ted's Melodies and Blues. What's going on, buddy? All right. Big Hard Books and Classics from Portland, Oregon. And Tony's here. Good to see everybody. So let's just ju dive right in. Assuming you kind of have a clue as to what you want, then it's all about the process. And one other thing that comes to mind that's a tangent but related is understanding how you learn best. You know, for me, I'm extremely visual. In addition to having, you know, the audio side of it, I'm very visual. So I'm, I'm into writing out tabs and seeing what's going on. I visualize my playing, things like that. Um, but figure out what the way that you learn best. And then let's just start from some survival tips. Let's see. Here's a tip. Tip number one. Don't go out. Let me, let me write these. I'm not going to write them all down, but I'm going to write down what number I'm on. Don't go out and buy every key harmonica when you first start playing. Why? I'll tell you exactly why. Because most people will buy the cheap set to get at least seven keys, or maybe they'll buy all 12. Now you've got 12 harmonicas that are just really below satisfactory, and they won't last you long. As you progress, you're going to want harmonicas that play a little bit better. So don't buy all the harmonicas. What should you buy? Um, what, what keys should you buy? That's tip number two. I recommend the following keys in the following order. C, A, G, D. Start with that. In that order, if you can only afford one, your budget allows for one, grab one, grab a C. If you can get two, grab a C and an A, and that'll serve you really well, etc. So that's tip, survival tip number one. Don't spend all your money out of the gates on something that won't last you. Same thing goes with gear, just to put it out there. Um, I think there's a little room to grow into gear more so than harmonicas. I mean, what I mean is it's okay in the beginning to buy something a little bit nicer in the gear department because you will grow into it. Um, yeah, so that, that's survival tip number one and two right there. Um, tip number three, breathe easy. Breathe easy. I should write these down. So what do I mean by that exactly? There's got to be this really relaxed, diaphragmatic, even pull of the air, an exchange that when you're breathing in and out feels really comfortable for you. There's no forcing anything. Volume comes from the, the diaphragmatic, uh, the use of your diaphragm and really pulling from the right area and regulating that airflow. That's where it comes from. So, yeah, you know what? Just breathe easy and try to develop your breathing from your diaphragm. Tip 
tip three. How do you do that? How can you work on that? You know, take some, I've got a G harmonica here right now, and I'm just taking some simple. <laughs> just taking a two draw and then one, two, three blow and one, two, three draw and just trying to rock that back and forth. The blow and the draw chords are played twice. Blow, blow, draw, draw, blow, blow. Get something easy or even just in and out. In, out, out, in. And obviously when you're playing single notes, uh, you want to apply the same sort of concept with your air. Let's see what's going on in the chat here. Yeah, DNA harps rock. They do. I mean, I'm a fan of all key harmonicas. There's a time and place for any of these keys to pop up and they seem to fit well. All right, survival tip number four. Listen more than you play. There's one. I have no idea, this is completely spontaneous. I'll just say that one more time. I'm just coming up with this on the spot. I promise. That's why I'm, I'm writing them down as I say them. <laughs> because maybe I'll put them somewhere maybe in the video description. Listen more than you play means both in practice and in real time. So if you're working in a practice session, you need to spend a decent amount of time listening to songs critically with, with you know, active listening, really trying to pick out details. And then the time you put in on the instrument will serve you much better because you'll be much more efficient with the process. Um, and listen more than you play on stage is a great rule of thumb. If you're not sure what to play, don't play anything. That kind of thing. Number five. Hear it in your mind first before you play it. Hear it in your mind first. And that goes, that can be a quick setup. Like for example, um, a good person to check out that you can observe this happening is Kim Wilson. Before he calls a song in, he'll sit there and go, one. He'll get that song going in his head, the, at least that intro right there. Take a minute and do that if you're playing blues. If you're going to play a melody, kind of like hear it. I also hear it as I'm playing it, and that is a really good strategy. It helps me to stay on track with what I'm playing. So hear it in your mind. And here's number six. See it if you can. Try to visualize as much as you can. I'm not going to go into a deep discussion on it, but I've talked about it before. I literally see the movements from draw to blow and approximate visualizations of if I were to go to three to six, it would go from underneath from the three draw to six blow up here. And I'd see that jump like a little arc going up. I have visuals, visualizations for techniques, etc. That helps me with recall so much, you guys. Okay, visualize music. Um, This kind of goes along with listen more than you play, but observe. What can you observe when you're, when you're just watching? There's a lot of stuff that body language is communicating that harmonica players do that you can grab and learn from, uh, whether it's how they keep time with their feet going in, maybe a sway, or whether it's when they look up to play, that is doing something. What are their hands doing? What, how do they use their cheeks? Do they, are they leaning in more? Are they straight ahead? Um, so you can see a lot. You can, you can, you'll learn something. So observe, that's number seven. All right, play often. There's a survival tip for you, play often. That means every single day if you can. And it doesn't mean it has to be with other folks, although ideally, if you're playing with other musicians, it's gonna take you much further because you're learning about how to communicate, musically speaking, with other musicians, and you're learning to make music in the most uh, vital context, which is actually with another human being, not a backing track. So play often, and if you are gonna play on your own, um, record yourself, tip number nine. If you're not recording, this is a big one, I learn more from posting YouTube videos and recording my audio 
or recording videos of myself over the years than anything else. It's the things that happen when we're so focused that we can't notice those things. We go back in the recordings and we can catch them. And that's awesome. So record yourself as much as you can. Doesn't matter what you use, use your phone. If you have a phone, if you don't have a smartphone, use something simple on your computer or an inexpensive recording device, like a dictaphone or something like this, and capture that and review it. So you're rec not only recording, but tip number 10 is, is review and adjust. Sorry, there's, I don't know if you guys can hear it, but there's some background noise going on with the dryer. Review and adjust. So you're reviewing your recordings, you're making adjustments, etc. Survival tip number 11. Uh, survival tip number 11. You guys got to give me something in the chat to feed off of. Like, for example, if you have questions, you can throw those in the chat and I can feed off of that and turn that into a survival tip. You know what I'm saying? Come on, y'all. And if somebody is, is so interested in doing this, maybe t share this video on a Facebook group or share it on your wall or put it somewhere. When in doubt, shake. <laughs> okay. Hey, man. I'm not judging. What's up, John? How about heart maintenance? Sure, let's, let's make a survival tip out of that. Heart maintenance. Um, keep your mouth clean. <laughs> and I don't mean uh, language. Keep your mouth clean, like before you play, brush your teeth, if you, ideally, uh, don't eat crackers or things that can get lodged in the reeds and don't have sugary sodas, etc. those types of things. Keep your mouth clean and the harp stays clean, and actually, that's the only maintenance I do. And my harps last a long time. I do not, the only reason I take apart a harmonica is if a reed is stuck or there's something that obvious that I can fix. If it's out of tune, it's going to a technician. Um, a lot of people might want to take them apart or put them inside of a jewelry cleaner. You could do that. You can clean your harps. Absolutely. Maybe every three or four months minimum, you're putting them in those jewelry cleaners, getting any dead skin or weird stuff that's inside. So yeah, keep them clean. As far as maintenance though, I don't do a lot of maintenance. Uh, yeah, I play with guitar players and they like keys of A and E mostly, which would put you for second position on a D and an A harmonica. So here's a survival tip. Learn at least two positions. Here's a good reason why. You might have a harp that goes flat at a gig or at a jam. You're right? And it's your D harp, but you've got your G harp so you can do a little third position. It might save you. Learn at least two positions. And third and second are my recommendations. By the way, I've got a huge sale going on. Totally sh didn't mention it, but I'm about to release it through my newsletter. 30% off at Harmonica123 starting today. You can use the code 30% off at checkout. Little percent sign. 30% off. Gives you 30% off any full-priced lesson or class, summit, etc. Um... Okay, survival tip number 13, subscribe to Ronnie Shellis' YouTube channel. Mm-hmm, that's right. And you know what's interesting is like, just to be very candid with everybody for a minute, I'm hyper aware of the fact that the quality of this channel has gone sideways or even south in the last year. I'm very much aware of that. The, um, the quality of the content, the, um, and I've done more promoting and just mentioning classes I have just had so much going on in my world personally, and I haven't had that creative space to put out unique content like I was. So if you haven't, first of all, let me just follow that up by saying, go back and look at all my old videos. I've got so many videos. I guarantee you the vast majority of you out there have not seen all these videos. And I did back in the day, put up a lot of unique content teaching you stuff. So go scope that out. My hope is to move forward and find that creative space inside of me. And as I travel on the road, that usually brings it out more. So I have a feeling it's gonna be nothing but up from here. Um, what's up everybody tuning in? Good to see you, good to see you. How can I make the train sound faster? We're on survival tip 
uh, number 14. Um, okay, here's my tip. Tip number 14 related to that. How can I get my train faster? Uh, build speed incrementally. That's my tip. Whoops, I got, I don't know if I lost you there for a minute. Um, <clears throat> build speed incrementally. That's my tip. Get really good technique and build it very slowly. Whoops. Set a metronome if you need to. Set the metronome to keep you on track where you know, hey, this is 60 BPM, beats per minute, or this is exactly 70 and it feels just like this. I'm gonna work that methodically and get to 73, 75, so that you're not messing up the tempo in the process, just trying to get to that really quick tempo. Thanks for that comment about the first position class. Hey, if you haven't seen that and you're wondering how you can learn about first position, just go to harmonica123.com. And at the very bottom, you can search products, type in first position. You'll see a host of uh, classes that are on first position that include first position. And you can get 30% off through Monday. This is a Memorial Day sale. All right. And thank you very much. Subscribe to my newsletter, not just this channel. Tip number 15. Subscribe to H123. Go to harmonica123.com. You can subscribe there. Why? Because I do send out emails notifying you about upcoming classes, sales, and sometimes just sort of like hipping you to some ideas to think about. Okay, we're on number 16. Thanks, CK. Yeah, the Dig 3 album is coming. We're looking forward to releasing it. You can subscribe to my Facebook group as well, Shellist Blues Harp Tips, if you're already on Facebook. By the way, I got my mic hidden today. See the little magnet? So the mic is underneath my little pullover. Hopefully it sounds okay. Um, where would you go to score a good, cheap practice amp in a jam? I would go hit thrift store first and music stores for used gear. Really, music stores that have used gear. Plug into all the old tube amps. Bring your mic or microphones with you and ask if you can plug in and play. That's the best way to find a good used practice amp. Or you could try to find one online, like a, like a new amp or a boutique amp like Stage 5 made for harmonica, and you can... Modify these amps if they're not modified. We talked about that yesterday with the idea of taking preamp tubes and swapping preamp tubes. Right on. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate the comment about um, learning harp with me. Saxophone, huh? Yeah, that makes sense that they've helped each other. You've been learning tenor sax, yeah, and learning harmonica. Not, well, of course, they go because they're both wind instruments. The interesting thing is with sax, we only got the one direction of air going out. And with harmonica, it's the only instrument in the world where air is moving in and out. What do you mean exactly by that, CK? Cash converter franchise. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe somebody else can answer that. Dig 3 will be available in UK or Europe. Well, it will be available as a, as a downloadable product. You'll be able to download the digital versions. All right, tip number 16, if you're still here with me today. Tip number 16. You, the sax comment made me think of this. So it is a bit of a survival tip, but I'm going to parlay it into something different. Listen. Listen to as many different instruments as you can when it comes to learning and stealing ideas for improvisation. Listen to other instruments. What does that mean? Saxophone, trumpet, guitar, piano, guitar, bass, whatever. Any instrument you can. You're listening for phrasing differences, tonal differences, um, and just try to soak up as much as you can. That's a great exercise. Edward wants to know what key harmonica do you need to play blues and reggae? I don't know. I think it just depends on the song. I don't know what key, maybe, the, I don't know what key reggae is commonly recorded in, so I can't really answer that, but I'm guessing various keys. So maybe if you throw me an example, I can help you out. 
Yeah, there you go, CK. Local local stores for the for the amp. Now, survival tip number 17. I'm trying to really push myself to be in the moment and just, uh, okay, here's a good one. And it's a topic that I'm probably going to be focused on for the upcoming Kerrville Harmonica Workshop coming June 5th through 7th in Kerrville, Texas. Look, w integrate your technique. So we learn all this great technique beyond single notes. We... We learn how to play octaves and how to tongue block and how to bend notes and how to warble and how to blow bend and all these great things. But I think the disconnect is often people are not sure how to integrate them. You can go to harmonica123.com. I'm not trying to pitch all these classes, but there's a class called Blending Technique for Musical Texture. And you can grab it at 30% off today using that coupon code 30% off. And so that class is all about how you can integrate technique. You take a riff, you strip it down to single notes, take a technique, here's one idea, and integrate one idea at a time substituting for one single note. Here's the substitution. put the two five draw split. So gotta work on integrating it or else you've learned it for nothing. You know what I mean? Gotcha CK. Not sure about that though. Well, you're probably right about that Lee Oscar natural minor. Honer also makes natural minor harmonicas. I think many manufacturers, more than one manufacturer makes those and if you want the chords, one, two, three, draw chords to be tuned minor, those natural minors are a good way to get that. Because when we play third position minor, we don't have access to those chords. We just have octaves that we can kind of substitute. All right, cool. So tip number 18, survival tip number 18. We're just rocking and rolling through these tips. First things that come to my mind. Learn incremental, now how we put the, how can I say this? Chew on less. <laughs> and what I mean by that is like, if you're gonna learn a melody or an instrumental, start by processing just a small amount of it. Start from the beginning, the intro of the song, for example, and just learn the first phrase or two perfectly to where you've got it the best you can before moving on and adding the rest of it. And when you do this, it's gonna be very much a snowball effect, domino effect, I don't know what we'd call this exactly, but by learning it properly and the best you can at first, everything that follows tends to kind of follow suit and you'll have better results that way. That's been my experience. And then you can add on a little bit more and work that whole section. And then a little bit more, you're practicing just that independent next chunk. And then you add that on. So now you've got three chunks that are pushed together that you've got. And that's the first 10 seconds of the song or whatever. So chew on less. And chew on less also applies to your practice sessions. Don't try to do 8,000 things. One or two ideas to work on in a 30-minute practice session is very productive. If it's 15 minutes or less, you only need one thing that you're working on. Like, for example... Uh, a scale that you're going to practice two or three different ways, but it's just the scale practice. All right. Number 19. What do we want to do for number 19? Number 19. Um, number 19. Mm. Cool. Right on, CK. Yeah, I don't know, number 19. Maybe if I play a little bit, it'll come to me. Okay, here's one. <laughs> uh, don't assume because you read it or heard it that it's true. From anyone, even from me, just don't assume. Do more research. Don't take somebody's advice from somebody you trust and say, well, that's the truth investigate to back it up and make sure that you believe what you've found to be true possibly or what resonates with you. 
Um, a good example of this is like over the years, people would say, whatever you do when you're playing third position, don't use the three draw. So for years, I was afraid to use the three draw. But I didn't realize that every time I was playing it over major songs, whether I was playing major or minor, I could switch back and forth between those third position scales, major pentatonic and blues scale, which is minor. And then I had access to that three draw, which I needed for... So for the major pentatonic, the note's relevant. Don't assume that just because you heard it or read it, it's not true. Or that it is true. Okay. Number 20, maybe this will be the... Got to get one more good, good, solid survival tip. It's hard sometimes because, you know, at this point, a lot of things are just sort of happening automatically without all the thought, which is great, but it makes it more difficult to come up with sometimes these survival tips. Present, here's one. Whatever you play, present each note like it's a, this is something I grabbed from Joe Felisco. Present each note like it's a symphony. And what I, how I interpret that is present each note with as much value and make that, that note sound as good as it can. And then the next note and the next note. So it means that you might have to slow down and pay attention to what you're really doing with the nuance of how you're playing. Present each note like it's a symphony. Joe said that to me once. I think he said it more like make it sound like it's a symphony, but he's just talking about even a single note. There's a quality that you can breathe into it and that, this emotional quality and physical thing that's happening. And when you slow down and do that, everything starts to have meaning. There's no throwaway notes. So pay attention to that. Renee, thank you for the tip. Very kind of you. As a beginner, a lot over my head, but very inspiring and motivating. Well, let's, maybe what we should do is just try to have a couple ending ideas that are more beginner oriented. I did start that way. So if you missed the beginning, check out the beginning of this video. For example, just to recap some of the beginning, like um, don't buy every key. Here are some certain keys that I recommend buying. C, A, G, and D listen more than you play a lot. In fact, I just want to pu put this out there that everything I teach in all of my classes, even the high end classes, like I'm teaching a little Walter class and I know it's pretty advanced. I teach it from the perspective of a beginner. I break, I try to break every single thing down as if I were talking to a beginner so that it makes sense so that there's no confusion as to the, to the terminology that I'm using when I'm talking about the technique. I try to decode that in the moment each time. And also just so that, because what happens is you're, if you become what you call, what we call collectively as an intermediate or beyond player, that's different for everybody. Some intermediate players are super advanced in one area and not so advanced in certain areas. And maybe another be intermediate player, it's the opposite. They're advanced in that area and not so advanced in the other. So, yeah. One-on-one -on -one lessons and private lessons. I offer those and yeah, they're a good idea to find, again, to find somebody that, that matches your, what you want out of the instrument. Like you hear what they do and you go, that's what I wanna do. That's somebody you wanna work with. Second ingredient is can they, can they break it down? Cause I know some players that I, are amazing and they cannot teach to save their lives. And it's, I'm not making fun of that at all. It's just not their forte, but their playing is like world-class. But then you go to try to learn something from them and it's like, I cannot follow this. They're talking over my head or they're sharing too much or they're not slowing down, breaking down this one little thing that I'm having trouble with. And then that's gonna keep me from getting all of it. So yeah, one-on-one -on -one lessons are great. A little bit of one-on-one -on -one goes a long way. You're recording those lessons so you can go back and review. I think a good teacher does one thing for sure that all good teachers do is they're listening as much as they're talking. They're trying to hear what the student is asking and what they want. 
and trying to give and deliver that to them so that they can help this person acquire that skill or information. All right, so this has been a mega list of survival tips so far. We got 20 of them. But the, the, Renee got me thinking about the beginner stuff because, so let me say my good buddy, Eric Noden, uh, maybe some of you know Eric Noden. He's actually a good harmonica player, but he's known for his guitar playing. Uh, and he's doing a five class course for beginners. And when he released that, it hit me. It was like, you just don't do much for beginners, Ronnie. <laughs> You're giving away a lot of intermediate and you've taught a lot of advanced stuff, but not much in the beginner realm. And I thought, my good buddy Eric is a wise guy to put that out there. And maybe that's something I can do too in a five part series that you can attend live. And then when it's over, you have all the recorded classes and they're done, you know, in succession, sort of not all in one day, but over the course of a week or so, I'm guessing that's how he's doing it. One thing I learned on guitar that applies to harmonica, you'll never be truly happy until you can play what you listen to. Yeah, absolutely. We're, I'm constantly striving to, to take what's in my brain and get it out of my instrument. <laughs> Here's a beginner tip. Don't be afraid to learn some tongue blocking early on. I began tongue blocking after year one or right around year one. Uh, I learned octaves probably before that, like how to play two of the same notes out of the side of the mouth. But then I'm talking tongue blocking single notes. Don't be afraid to do that and integrate it even if you're gonna stick to pucker playing. Yeah, exactly. Making heart videos on your channel, it does greatly help me grow. The more we teach, here's another tip 21. Doesn't matter if you're a beginner, you know something. Teach somebody who's, uh, who's knows less than you. Share something. By sharing it, you're forced to really think about what, how you think about it and what you really know. And it's, you're processing it on a different level. It's, teaching is a great way to learn. So teach others. And it can be something simple, like you're just helping somebody get something simple. Cool, Whist you can, if you can whistle it, you can play it. Yeah, that's cool. Is that split octaves? So splits and octaves are two different things. They're the same technique on the bottom of the harp covering two holes, but octaves produce the same note and splits produce different notes. Pretty simple, right? So. All of them are octaves with the exception of on the bottom of the harp, two, five draw and three, six draw. So listen to the octaves. They sound clean and they shimmer. So when you hear that sound, you're, you're listening to an octave. And when you hear more tension, you're creating the split. So those are splits. And then most people often swap the terms or confuse or use them loosely. Hey, what's up, Matthew? Good to see you here. Right on, glad to hear that. Playing those bends has been awesome. Matthew, do you have anything on your channel? Do you have any videos posted? Let us know. Matthew's playing some great harp. He's one of my members at the Harmonica 123 membership, which includes two live Q and A sessions that are about an hour and 20 minutes each time members come on and share and play. We record it so you can go back and listen to it. Krill, welcome. Is that your name? Kirill? Did I say that right? Kirill Kuchin? <laughs> you finally made it. Welcome. I'm... And y'all have a good day. I'll see you later. Just kidding. Kirill, I'm sticking around for you, buddy. Okay. Here's another tip. Tip 22. Work on dynamic range. I don't think people are working on this. I don't hear it in the average person's playing. Dynamic range means going from quiet to loud. And loud to quiet. And all the in-between.
So you've got to learn your dynamic range. What is the low end of it? What is the sweet spot in the middle? And what's the high end of your dynamic range? And when you are aware of that, you can start to play with that and use that because that's what creates more of this tension in your music and you need it. Speaking of awareness, tip number 23, be an aware player. That means when you practice and when you're, when you're actually performing and playing with an, another person, be aware of everything. Try to be aware of how much you're playing, how loud you're playing. Try to be aware of what the message of the song is. What are the lyrics communicating? You know, you can, you can catch yourself doing something in the moment and adjust that and change it if you're a really aware learner and an aware player. Okay. Matthew says he's got a few videos posted there. Well, here's, I'm pushing you. There's tip number 24. Share what you do with others. Take a little bit of critical feedback. Trust me, I've gotten more critical feedback having a YouTube channel <laughs> than I care to admit. Um, people are going to shove their opinions out there and tell you exactly what they think, and that's fine. I may not always agree, um, and I don't need to. And, and I try not to judge somebody who's judging me. I can learn from what they're saying. Oh, here comes a truck. Let's see if that comes through the mic. It's a loud truck. So, yeah, share as much as you can, though. By sharing, you're, you're putting yourself out there and you're building confidence each time because when you do get some good feedback, it's, it's confirmation for you. So share your music. And that could be anything. It could be with a person in, in the room. It could be on sharing it to YouTube or whatever with family. I got myself into a bad habit holding the harp with my right hand. Well, you know what? There are a couple pro players that leave the low notes from left to right still and play like that. One of them being Carlos Del Junco, I believe. And there's one or two others that I've seen, not many, like literally just a few over the years. Um, but if you do want to work with it switching into your left hand, that's not too tough. You can do that. You just, it's just going to feel like you're starting over for like the first five to seven days. It'll be like, oh my God, this feels like I'm like, do it right now and try it. And you'll see it. It feels like, what? This is just so weird. But then that adjustment over the course of the week once you adjust, you're playing, for me, the, when I switched, because I was a right-handed player too, and after a year or two, somebody was getting on me, switch, 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 and I didn't, and just to like prove him wrong that I could, and then I was like, oh, I get it. All that important sound on the low end is, is easier to control and encapsulate by holding in the left hand, low notes to the left. That's what's most typical, but any, anything is possible. So, what was important to you in learning harp for the first year? There were a lot of things. Um, exploration, so there's a tip, survival tip. Feel free to explore. Don't feel like you have to be confined to learning O oh Susanna and learning the blues riff. Put on a jam track and just try to make sound and improvise even if you don't know what you're doing or just have fun, allow yourself to explore. I did a lot of exploration and it was a blast. And I was really nervous every time I played in front of people. But it just taught me that, it can't, that, I, that I was doing something that at least some people wanted to hear. And it felt great to know that I was doing something that somebody appreciated. So explore and take it, really get creative because this exploration is how you're going to find your own voice also. At the end of the day, you're going to start to find your voice by by not always trying to copy. At first, that's what we need to do so we can get a basis for the language, right? But then, eventually, we want to find our own voice. That's tip 25, by the way. I really wanna thank you guys for helping me procrastinate. I do have something looming that I have to do and I'm just trying to push it out as much as I can. Ah, oh, isn't that nice, thank you very much. No one can survive without Ronnie. I have a feeling you can. Pete Austin, what's going on, buddy? So it's really good to see all you here. If you're just joining and you missed so far what's been going on, I've been rapid firing from the top of my mind survival tips, and we're up to number 20, we're up to 26, 
for the next one, but it's organic. I'm just seeing what comes to mind and we're looking at the chat. If you wanna use the chat to ask a question or make a comment or whatever about what you've observed, that will help me to help everyone. So. Make sure you're really listening to a lot of, I said earlier, listen to a lot of different instruments for inspiration. What about listening to a lot of different styles of music? Add that to that one because one thing I know for sure is that by branching out and learning to play a little bit of jazz, a little bit of funk and rock, it has really rounded me as a player more well-rounded as a blues harmonica player because of all those influences. I worked with a band called Available Jones for a few years, and it was all, you know, pop, rock, a little bit of funk, Dr. John, we we're mixing it up. And all that stuff, and Grant Green was in the mix, a couple Grant Green songs, total funky jazz stuff. And it just, I wanted to be, I wanted to be playing blues. That was what I really wanted, but that was the opportunity that came about, and I took it, and I'm glad I did it, because when I bring that into my playing, so there's tip 26, draw from many genres of music and really try to pull that into your focus. If your focus is blues harmonica, let's say the majority of people here, their focus is blues harmonica, just hypothetically, take that and pull it in. Take one riff and pull it in. Take a looser idea and pull that in. Let it just hit you and try to pull in the feeling best you can. Yeah, great, Michael. Good tip. Find a local open mic, which goes along with my tip earlier to be playing as much as possible. Absolutely. Be brave. Get up with a guitar player and see what happens. You're never going to know, and it's going to be scary as hell the first time, no matter what. So you just got to do it. Leave the top of your mouth stationary and only move the bottom jaw. Holes four through seven. Okay, there's another tip from Matthew right there. Check that out. Sometimes we have to find efficiency in our technique, right? And that's kind of what you're explaining. You start to realize that you can eliminate certain things. There's a great tip. Be efficient, as efficient as you can with your playing, efficiency in general. And this is a loose survival tip, but what I mean is uh, if you can grab the note be beside you without moving left to right, and you can just move your jaw, do that. If you can get a warble by barely moving your head, just enough to get those two notes, don't go further than you need to. Same with breath. If you can draw lighter and get lots of volume, you guys, it sounds like I'm breathing hard, but I'm, I'm breathing real easy. I just am, regulating that air from the diaphragm and pulling it in evenly. So efficiency, be efficient as a player. That also applies to your musical ideas. You're playing a solo. You don't always have to play everything you hear. So there's a tip. <laughs> play some of what you hear. Practice that. Like, you, like put on a jam track and just be playing and then hear an idea, but don't start, don't start playing it, but follow that idea like you're, like you're playing it in your mind. Follow the riff and then at some point come in and complete the idea and then leave a note out and come back in. If you can practice that way, it's going to be very telling like because you're going to develop cool phrasing that way and you're going to force your listener to be really listening more intently to what you're playing because you're not just spouting out a million riffs. That was a tip we mentioned earlier, Shane. That's a good one. You weren't here for it. I think you might've just popped on, but yeah, we t that's the exact tip that I laid out and I totally, totally agree with it. Small, we were talking about practice sessions being very targeted. And it's true. And we talked about recording yourself because these things are 
the answers that you're seeking. You cannot find them in the moment if you're not recording because you're focused on the task at hand. So you're distracted and you're not catching that little thing you're doing that you're like, oh, I didn't even realize I was doing that. By the way, it's not always like we're trying to record to hear what's not working. We're trying to hear what is working also. What's working well so I can continue to, to develop and integrate that thing as well. I forgot what was number 28. What was my last tip? I can't remember. Well, you can always go, you know, you can switch for a while. You got to commit though. If you're going to do the switch for, to work on the Wawa and go to your left hand, Give it a while. Let it feel weird for several days is my advice and just keep working it. Let's just do this. Uh, the, just to remind you how I'm holding it. A little bit of an arc in the finger. Back part of the harmonica. Little C shape. And then that wah will be there. You know what, what communicates more than anything else from you as a musician is your, is your tone. Who was it that said it? Your face is your tone? Um, was it, um, what's the Latin blues rock guitar player totally spaced out? Most famous Latin rock blues guitarist, everybody, in the world. Who is it? I'll wait. <laughs> who is it, who is it, who is it that I'm thinking of? But I think he said it. So thank you, Dan Santana. Jeez. I think he said that, your tone is your face. Meaning it's your identity, your sound is your identity. All right, everybody, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Everyone's like, Santana, you fool. Um, and like, so that goes back to what I said earlier is that like give each note, treat it like it's a symphony or make it valuable. Your sound is literally your identity. So each, the building blocks of your sentences, your phrases, your musical ideas is your tone. Not just the note, the tone. What is behind the note? So if your tone and your approach is weak and thin, Nothing you play that might be otherwise would have been fascinating matters and no one can really latch onto it because your tone isn't there. Work on tone first and breathing. Work on tone. And you can work on this by that dynamic range exercise of soft to quiet. Because that's the one thing, I said it earlier, but that's the one thing that I'm missing that I want to hear from other people. Newbie question, struggling with finding backing tracks. You have a C, A, and an F. You're used to the M, C, C, D sessions. All right, so I'm playing the same things. Um, I've got a bunch of backing tracks that you can, if you want to write to me at harmonica123 on the contact page, I'll send you some suggestions of things that are different from the same old. Because I got some that I sell that are this kind of the same old that you might be like, this is just like what I was hearing. But then I have some that are just not. Like I have my own backing tracks from my CD till then. I took some of the electric tracks and created like eight or nine backing tracks from the CD. And there's some other ones out there that are just not the same old. And that's a pretty good question because if you're going to use a backing track to practice, then you, you don't want to use the same type of thing over and over. But you could be looking for, besides MCCD sessions, look for like Quist, Q-U-I-S-T. He's got some cool jazz and funk and blues in the mix. I love that, Pete. Love, I'm going to repeat what Pete said. If it, start, if it starts not being fun, leave it alone for a while. I agree, because you're not going to be motivated and it's going to turn this instrument that we love and we're attracted to uh, playing and it's going to be like, eh, I don't know if I want to do that. I agree with that. F harp second position, super tramp, take the long way home. Your dynamic breathing is tonal. Yep. Looking forward to seeing you next month in Canada, but I won't be in Canada next month. 
I will not be in Canada. Maybe you're thinking of somebody else that will be up there at an event. There is a harmonic event happening in Canada that I know of. There's one that I can think of, but I will not be there. I will be in Texas. I will be going through Mississippi and I'll up through Illinois. Yep, Carrie says work on your rhythm, and we talked a little bit about that as well. You can make great riffs with one or two notes. Yeah, like this. Yeah, Dunville is the one I was thinking of. That's right. But I won't be there. But it's a cool event. Great organizer. Kevin uh, is awesome. So those that are thinking of going up there or are going to definitely head up there, you should enjoy it. Roly is going to be there. Roly Platt. Yeah. Cool. I do six blow and six draw to backing tracks. What else do you do with that? And what position are you in? And what does that really mean? Like, give us more information. So, there's a lot of tips that I've laid out. I think I might just type up some of the ones that I captured most of these. Here's a recap. Hi, Dad. I talk about the flame test. Could you talk a little bit about breath control? We did talk a little bit about it. The flame test was this video I posted on YouTube where I held the lighter out to almost arm's length, slight bend in my hand, light it. And if you blow, if you light the lighter and you blow at it and you blow out the flame, you're, you're not really breathing properly for harmonica. Your goal is a steady stream of air that does not blow the flame out would be the perfect amount of air to be breathing. And that's, that was to help describe diaphragmatic breathing. Um, but I think the big thing that I mentioned about breath control is regulation and dynamic range. Because when you start to regulate your air and make this nice stream of air even from blow to draw, it's gonna make a huge playing, I mean, a huge difference in your playing. And the dynamic range helps you become aware even further of breath control because you're forced to determine, do I wanna open that valve the, a little more and let a little more air for a little more volume or do I wanna relax it and get it quieter? And then that ties in the other survival tip of awareness. You're just becoming more and more aware of what you're actually doing versus the guy, not to pick on anybody or a gal, a person who just plays same volume and less. there's less intention in their playing. There's a great tip. Be intentional with your playing. I've said that a million times on this channel. Be intentional. It just means put intention behind the note. Does it mean something to you? If not, don't play it. If it doesn't sound or feel right, get the note right, then move on. I'd rather hear you play something really simple, like a six draw and a six blow, <laughs> or whatever, and just play it with conviction. Any tips on blow bending? Regulate the air. Don't blow harder. Work on your technique. Get the tip of the tongue positioned behind the bottom teeth, and it folded and tucked forward in the roof of the mouth to the point where you don't blow out any air, where there's almost no air pushing out. When that's done, put it up here on like nine blow on a G and try it and see what happens. Running the major diatonic from high to low. Cool, I'll stay on six draw and six blow. Working on rhythm, occasionally adding seven drop. Yeah. I mean, there's a million ways to work these things too. I think that we should all be doing what feels right to us, but sometimes you need to explore beyond what we're doing so we can find new ways so we're not bored. I did talk about speed. I, it's one of my tips. I said, build it incrementally. So whatever you put in the, the basics of that suggestion is that if you wanna build speed, 
you've got to build accuracy first. So if you have an idea, get the technique perfect. Do this in single note fashion first. And make sure you can replicate it the same way exactly 10 times in a row at a slow, controlled pace. Etc. Then you set like a metronome for the next BPM, three to four BPMs faster. And so on. And then just make sure you don't go faster than you're capable of playing. And it, th you're making me think of this thing like, when is it time to like, bring something that you're working on into your playing, like if you're out at a gig or whatever, there's never a great time. Try it. Unless you really don't have control and you know it, maybe save it and develop that to where you're like, I think I do. Well, then it's time to put it out there. And if you fall flat on your face, you learn something from it. You try again the next time. So those are my tips today. It's been fun to hang with you. Almost an hour here we've been hanging out. And uh, appreciate all of you for sticking with me today. Um, if you want to go to the website and take advantage of the Memorial Day sale starting today, running through Monday, it's 30% off my classes and my summits. Check them out. I'll put a link in the information in the video description for you. And be sure to subscribe, like this video so I can get some fun. I got no likes in here. Maybe you guys could give it a like. I'm only at 23 likes, poor me. And that'll help me reach more folks so that I can continue to grow this channel, okay? That's what I say. <laughs> That's what I say. Thanks everybody. Appreciate all of you for tuning in. I'll see you soon. I don't know when, but I guarantee you it'll be soon. Make it a great day. <laughs>